On November 20, 1943, in the cover of the night, a large United States Navy fleet approached the Japanese strongpoint on Besho Island, the largest island of the Tarawa Atoll. Men of the 2nd Marine Division began boarding their landing crafts. All was quiet, but not for long. The Battle of Tarawa was about to begin. The Tarawa was the main objective of the operation, to establish the strong points in the Gilbert Islands archipelago, in the New Island Hopping Strategy. Besides Tarawa, the island of Makin, and the small island of Apamama, situated also in the Gilbert Archipelago, were chosen as the targets. However, the Gilbert Islands, were not supposed to be the first point, for the start of the U.S. Navy campaign in the Central Pacific. The Pacific Theater, was split into two main lines of the attack, towards Japan. One route was to run from the Solomon Islands, and New Guinea through the Philippines. This southwestern Pacific area, was under the command of General Douglas MacArthur. The advance through the Central Pacific, was the task of the U.S. Navy, under the command of Admiral Chester Nimitz. Initially, the U.S. Navy wanted to start the Central Pacific campaign by capturing strategically important Marshall Islands, moving forward towards the Mariana Islands, and further to Japan. However, the U.S. Navy planners, soon realized that advance through the Central Pacific would be exposed from the flanks, if they do not take the Japanese bases on the Gilbert Islands. The Gilbert Islands, were the most southerly point of the Japanese defense, situated on the transport routes from Hawaii, and the United States, to Australia and New Zealand. The attack on the Gilbert Islands, also presented the opportunity for the Navy, to test a new island hopping strategy. The island hopping, was a very simple approach. To avoid spending resources and lives, trying to capture every occupied island, the Navy intended to bypass the heavily fortified enemy islands, and focus their efforts on less defended islands, large enough for the construction of the airfield. Afterwards, the Navy and Air Force would implement a blockade of the islands, still in Japanese hands by cutting off their supply routes. In theory it was a simple strategy, however, the islands suitable for the construction of the airfields, were the ones most heavily defended. Tarawa Atoll was one of these islands. The Tarawa Atoll, is formed by the multiple islands, forming a chain around a large lagoon. On the last island to the west, Besho, Japanese forces constructed an airfield. For the landings on Besho Island, the Navy assigned the 2nd Marine Division, under the command of Major General Julian C. Smith. The plan of the attack, was straightforward. The invasion fleet was to approach the Tarawa Atoll from the west, and landing on the Besho was to be done from the lagoon's side. The planners decided to launch the attack from the lagoon, expecting lighter fortifications, and lighter defense on the northern side of the island. The north coast of the Besho, was divided into three landing beaches, codenamed, from the west to east as, Red 1, Red 2, and Red 3. The western coast was given a code name Green Beach. The 3rd Battalion, of the 2nd Marine Regiment, under the command of Major John Shirtle, were to land on Red 1. The 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Amey, were to land on Red 2, and the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marine Regiment, under the command of Major Henry Crow, would land on Red 3. The other battalions of the 2nd and 8th Marine, would land on Besho Island in the 2nd and 3rd wave, while the 6th Marine Regiment would be held in the reserve. The three battleships, two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and the destroyers of Task Force 53, were to provide artillery support for the landing troops. The air cover, aerial bombing, and strafing, was the task of carrier-based aircraft from the three aircraft carriers, the Essex, Bunker Hill, and Independence. The Besho is a small island, with an area of just 1.5 square kilometers. Surrounded by the coral reef. 
the coral reef, would not present an obstacle for the first three waves of infantry, as they were to land on shore in tracked LVTs. However, the rest of the troops, were to come ashore in the Higgins boats. The planners did not have sufficient knowledge, about the tide in a lagoon. They expected the normal rising tide, to provide a sufficient water level over the reef, enough for the Higgins boats, to pass this natural obstacle. This planning oversight, will play a significant role during the battle. The coral reef was the first line of the Japanese defense. The Japanese high command, was well aware of the importance of the Gilbert Islands. On such a small island, the Japanese placed a garrison with almost 5,000 men, under the command of Rear Admiral Keiji Shibazaki. Because of the small area of the island, a considerable amount of which was taken up by the airfield, and its facilities, Shibasaki concentrated his efforts, on defeating the invader at the water's edge. Consequently, the beach defenses were formidable. Along the entire coastline, the Japanese troops built a series of trenches, strong points, gun emplacements, concrete bunkers, and shelters. Forty artillery pieces, and many more anti-aircraft heavy machine guns, were scattered around the island in various reinforced firing pits. The heaviest artillery pieces, the four 203mm naval guns, were placed in two pairs, on the far western, and eastern end of the island. For the Japanese troops defending the island, surrender was not an option. At 5 a.m. on November 20, 1943, a naval bombardment began. Gunfire from the battleships and cruisers lit the sky. Artillery barrage was so fierce, that one admiral said, we do not intend to neutralize the island, we do not intend to destroy it, we will obliterate it. However, artillery is well known, to produce more noise than damage. At 6 a.m., the aircrafts started their bombing run. The artillery barrage lasted until 9 a.m., when the amphibious assault began. As soon as the barrage stopped, surviving Japanese troops left their shelters and took their positions. The first waves of the Marines, begin their approach to the beach, expecting that the Besho defenses had indeed been obliterated. As they get to the firing range of the defenders, suddenly they faced, devastating Japanese fire. The tracked LVTs, did not offer sufficient protection against anti-aircraft guns. Some LVTs were blown away by point-blank artillery fire. The resistance on Red 1 and Red 2, was especially fierce. Companies assigned for landing in the first wave, suffered heavy losses and were reduced to 50% of the strength, as they reached the shore. Faced with heavy fire, LVTs on the way to the Red 1 beach, were forced to veer off course, heading far to the west or the east, towards Red 2 Beach. A group of the Marines, landed ashore, at the junction of the Red 1, and Green Beach. Major Michael Ryan, commander of L Company, 3rd Battalion 2nd Marine was among them. Immediately, he took command of this mixed force, of the Marines from various companies, LVT drivers, heavy weapons crew, engineers and signalers. On the Red 2 beach, Marines faced rows of enemy emplacements. The first waves of troops, suffered heavy losses. The beach was crowded with casualties. Those who managed to survive, were forced, to seek the cover. Somehow, they formed themselves into small mixed units, and tried to move inland. A little progress was made. In the attempt to move his men from the Red 2, Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Amey, commander of 2nd Battalion, 2nd Marines, was killed. He was replaced by Lieutenant Colonel Walter Jordan, an observer from the 4th Division, who was the only senior officer present on the beach. Under covering fire, of the destroyers Ringgold and Dashiel, the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marine, landed on Red 3 Beach with minimal losses. Although they made limited progress inland, their main concern was to hold the arrival of Japanese reinforcements, from the eastern part of the island. 
After about two hours of fighting, the Marines finally get the leader. At 10.30 a.m., Colonel David M. Shoup, a divisional operations officer, reached the shore. Although wounded in the leg, he assumed the command of the forces on the Red 2 and Red 3 beach. He manages to coordinate the troops on the beaches and organize them enough to begin to push inland. For his actions and leadership during the three days of fighting, Colonel Shoup was awarded the Medal of Honor. During the morning, the first armor started to arrive on the island. Seven Sherman medium tanks arrived on the Red 3, and only one with a disabled main gun managed to reach Major Ryan's group, at the junction of the Red 1 and Green Beach. At 11.30 a.m., 3rd Battalion 8th Marines, started their approach towards Red 3. They would come ashore by Higgins' boats. Nightmare scenario unfolded, as the Higgins' boats grounded on the coral reef. The Marines had to reach the shore by walking through the shallow water for a few hundred meters, under the devastating Japanese fire. The losses were horrifying. Seeing what was going on at the reef, General Smith cancelled the landing of the 1st Battalion 8th Marines. Marines on the island were now on their own. As they could not count on any reinforcements for the rest of the day, the success or failure of the mission was in their hands. The furious close quarter fighting raged the whole day. Elements of 2nd Marines managed to infiltrate into the triangle formed by the airfield taxiway. During the afternoon, an event of great significance for the course of the battle occurred. Marines spotted a group of Japanese officers, standing in the open. In a moment, the main gun salvo, from destroyers Ringgold and Dashiel felt near them. Unknowing by Marines, this salvo killed Admiral Shibazaki, and his entire staff. Japanese defenders were left headless. As the night approached, Marines started preparation for the upcoming Japanese counterattack. This photo, taken in 1944, well after the battle, is the best way to illustrate the area of Red 2 and Red 3 sectors at the end of the first day. Colonel Shoup, headquarters was here. Elements of the 8th Marine Regiment were here in this perimeter. This area, was the sector of the 2nd Marine Regiment. The elements of the 2nd Marine were trapped in the triangle between the airfield and the taxiway. As the night fell on the Besho Island, Marines were determined to hold their foothold at all costs. No one knew the actual strength of Japanese forces. Fear that Japanese troops will push them back to the sea was present throughout the night. However, Japanese defenders, never received an order to attack. No one was alive who could issue it. The night has passed relatively quiet. There was sporadic fire exchange and nothing else. The first daylight, brought the certain relief among the marines although they were aware, that a new day, brings new heavy fighting. The beginning of the second day, was almost exactly like the first. After spending most of the first day, and the night, embarked in their Higgins boats, without the use of toilet, food or drink, the 1st Battalion 8th Marines, received the order to head for Red 2. With the first lights of dawn, they went. The Higgins boats again, grounded on the reef, and a long walk towards the shore began. They met the same fate as the 3rd Battalion. Only half of them reached the shore. During the morning, the time has come for Major Ryan's group, to play their role in the battle. In a perfectly coordinated attack, destroying one enemy emplacement after another, they went all along the green beach, reaching the pair of 203mm naval guns by 11 am. The beachhead on the western coast of the island, was now clear. General Smith, decided to use this unexpected gain. During the afternoon, he ordered the landing of the 1st Battalion 6th Marine Regiment, held in reserve, to land on the Green Beach. By the evening, the 1st Battalion 6th Marine, completed the landing unopposed. 
On the Red 2 and Red 3 sector, heavy fighting raged all day, as the Marines tried to reach the south coast of Besho. During the day, the first 75mm howitzers, arrived on shore, followed by more heavy weapons. The tide of the battle, begun to shift in the Americans' favor. At 4 p.m., Colonel Shoup, sends a situation report, to division headquarters, with now famous phrase, casualties many, percentage dead not known, combat efficiency, we are winning. By the end of the second day, a small group of marines from the 2nd and 8th marine regiments, succeed in crossing the airfield, reaching the southern coast, of Besho Island. Throughout the day, without proper leadership, the Japanese were disorganized. As the night fell on the second day, they were no longer the force that presented a threat. It was their turn to wait for the night with worry. At the beginning of the third day of fighting, on November 22, General Julian Smith, ordered the 3rd Battalion 6th Marine, to land on the Green Beach. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion 6th Marine, began the advance eastward, to clear the pocket between Green Beach and Airfield, to link with men of the 2nd Marine. The 8th Marine was ordered to push the enemy further to the east. Close combat raged all day. The Japanese troops, hidden in concrete bunkers, fought to the last man. The distance between the enemies, was often less than a few meters. Destroying bunker by bunker, the marines, slowly advanced. By the end of the third day, the marines held the western two-thirds of Besho Island. During the night, marines experienced something, that was to become familiar throughout the Pacific theater, the famous Banzai Charge. Although failed, the Banzai Charge, inflicted significant losses to defending marines. By 1 p.m., on November 23, 1943, all resistance ceased, last enemy pockets had been cleared. The Besho Island was in American hands. Fighting on the small islands of Tarawa Atoll, lasted a few more days. The victory came costly, 1,009 marines died, and more than 2,000 were wounded. Out of almost 5,000 Japanese defenders, only 17 soldiers were captured. The start of the island hopping did not turn out as the Navy expected. At least now, the Navy knew what to expect, in the upcoming months. Besho Island on Tarawa Atoll, was the first stop on the long road, which will last for two more years.